everybody. Welcome to Expat Diaries podcast, where today we are going to go down some interesting pathways and journeys and learn all about Richard Beckson and Costa Rica investments and all of the things he's done to get to this point. He's been uh, in Costa Rica for years and has learned all of the ins and outs that probably some of us, like, I'm just here to help people pick other people's brains because these are things I want to know. If you want to know something too, drop them down in the comments. And I am sure that um, Richard will come back and look at this and answer some of those questions for you. But without uh, waiting any further whatsoever, Richard, welcome to Expat Diaries podcast. Thank you very much for having me on it. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 you know, I think I'm about to put on 20 years here in Costa Rica. So uh, uh, yeah, most of my adult life. Yeah. Living the dream. So more here than in the UK. Yeah, I mean, I left the UK when I was 20, met my wife in the States, in Minnesota, of all places, at Costa Rica and Britain, met in Minnesota, and then moved here, well, I came here first time in 2002, moved full time in 2005, like March 2005, yeah. Yes, but your your wife isn't from Minnesota. No, no, she's from Costa Rica. That's just, just weird how a Costa Rican and a Brit met in northern Minnesota. People are like, I, how did that happen? So. I love that. I mean, I think that is like the things that are supposed to happen. They're, they're supposed to be like that. I've, I've talked to so many expats that are like, have been single their whole life. Like this one gentleman I spoke with had been single his whole life. He moved to Costa Rica when he was 60. Never been married, never had kids, found the love of his life in Costa Rica. And she's from Peru. Yep, it like, happens. It's like, yeah. okay, everyone just follow where you're supposed to be. And then that's where your, that's where your person or your people are at. What were you doing in Minnesota? I was working for a hotel group and so was she on a work and travel program. So, uh, yeah. And, um, you know, I mean, we were kids and I suppose we're still young at heart at the moment and now have two kids live up here in Aredia. And yeah, I, I love this country. I have no intention. I have citizenship. I have no intention of moving back to the UK. Um, yeah, it just, I mean, mm. you know, weather is beautiful. Food is great. I've got two kids, eight and 11. And, you know, we made the decision that we thought it was a better a better, I would say, worldly education here in Costa Rica rather than kind of joining the Borg in the UK, as I like to say. So right. It's funny. I was I was reading um I was reading a book and it was talking about how our education system is really not there to teach you anything. It's teach you to it, you're just in charge of memorizing the things we want you to know. Yeah. You're not really there to learn. You're there to memorize the things. Correct. That and, you know, go and get a job basically for a large corporate company and do get on the treadmill, get a mortgage and do that for the rest of your life. So yeah. it's, nothing's wrong with that. It's just, you know, I think there's more to life than that. And, you know, um, I believe in freedom and I think that we have a lot of freedom here in Costa Rica in, in many aspects. So. Well, and the fact that you get to show them that there are options, right? So uh, I think a lot of times um, I'm in the Midwest also. Um, and I think a lot of people I've met people who've never even left their county. Yep. And I'm like, what? Well, I mean, like, why? Like, why? I just don't even understand. But let's go, let's go back to this. So, uh, so you guys met in Minnesota, yep. um, fell in love, and then she showed you Costa Rica because you'd never been here before. Yeah, I had not, in all honesty, Robin, uh, I was very naive. Well, I, yeah, maybe naive. I had no idea where Costa Rica, I thought it was North and South America. We don't get told that Central America exists in the UK. It's North and South. If Central America is not part of any of our maps like it's there but it's not called central america it's either north or south so uh and she said costa rica and i was like okay that sounds interesting and i got on a plane december 2022 flew down here went to arenao went up to papagayo went to Haco, which again was very very different 20 years well 20 odd years ago and um yeah i thought this is pretty cool went back to the us worked for a couple of months quit my job and moved to costa rica and went back to the uk Started a business, finished my, um, I did an accounting investments degree, finished that. And then was like, my wife came over to the UK, spent about nine months, got to like February through the winter and was like, I don't know how you guys do this. Let's go to Costa Rica. So yeah, I, at that time, I think I was 22, moved here, got married um, and started work for a travel company. Um, and then that just really set off my career here in Costa Rica. So um, the travel company that you started work for, and I 100% agree with her on the cold weather. It's stupid. Um, I Every winter I walk out of my house and I go, when I'm in the U.S., I'm like, why do I live here? Why do, what does anybody live here? Um, and those people that post on Facebook, can't wait for the snow and blah, you're, you're silly. Um, so tell me, you went to work for a travel company. So was it a Costa Rican based travel company or was it a U.S. based? So oh, it, was a, it was a Costa. It was called. It was Costa Rican Vacations. It was a very small company back then, maybe seven people. Um, I basically was in sales. Then, after two months, decided to buy a franchise of their business. I say franchise, but the 
founder, Casey, who's my business partner now in many things that we do, um, said it wouldn't work. Um, so I basically t wrote up a contract saying to give it to me for free, which he did. Um, he says it was probably one of the best and worst, you know, business. <laughs> I uh, taught myself to code HTML, CSS back then. Um, you know, this was prior to WordPress and, you know, yeah, PHP, et cetera. Uh, and built that website over a couple of months. I was working during the day, at night. Uh, I think I was sleeping maybe four or five hours, working seven days a week. Wow. That then became 25% of their sales within a year. I had my own sales and marketing department, um, kind of as a franchise. And then they came to me one day and said, Hey, Rich, we'd like to buy your business from you and really buy you and bring you in as a partner, and which they did in 07. And um, yeah, that company now is probably Latin America's largest luxury travel company. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I think it manages close to 30 or 40,000 vacations, custom designed vacations here in Costa Rica a year. And what's the name of that company? Costa Rican Vacations. So you can just go to their website, vacationscostarica.com. Um, I sold out of that business about, what, about a year and a half, two years ago. Um, I just got bored of sitting in a room and uh, staring at numbers. I like to be out in the field. Um, but during that time, built hotels here in Costa Rica as well, helped hoteliers kind of invest here and investors invest. And I decided that that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to kind of help people invest in Costa Rica as well as create our own investments uh, here. So we've got a project in Manuel Antonio at the moment, which we did like via a fraction investment, which are luxury villas in the jungle of Manuel Antonio, but in the heart, you can literally 200 meters and you're right there by El Avion um, and bought that from a hotel owner who I'd known for many, many years, um, just because tourism is very small here. So everyone knows everyone, um, you know, and I think, you know, your reputation is everything here in Costa Rica because it's such a small country. Everybody knows everyone. And I mean that, I mean, there's 5 million people here, but in tourism, there's probably, you know, I don't know, 50,000 people. So, you know, and the majority of people know each other. So, right. so, yeah, that was kind of my journey growing that business, exiting that, starting another business. So I when did you, so when did you exit? 2022. So okay. not us through the pandemic. I actually took a sabbatical in 2018 for six months, came back um, and was kind of like, what are we going to do? Decided to just, you know, basically go, go nuts with the business, which we did and grew it. Then pandemic came. Um, you know, went from 130 staff down to 35. It was probably, I would say, I would say professionally, probably the worst, almost difficult challenges I've ever had is letting go of all those people because some of them had been in the business for many, many years. But right. uh, I think we did it very well, very delicately. And a lot of them came back as, as tourism came back, uh, okay. which was very nice. So, um, so yeah. And um, yeah, so I exited that and started helping people invest in Costa Rica from vacation rentals to hotels to land development. You know, I'm sure it's, you may be aware of, and it's very complicated here. It is very complicated here. And I am aware of it. We have been through the pain. I've, I've, I mourned the loss of a hotel we were trying to buy. <laughs> I mourned it for a, for a whole year. Well, probably not. I probably mourned it for about six months. I'm still a little salty about it, but um, I'll get, I'll get past that. Um, yeah, it is. And one of the things that having someone like you to navigate this stuff is like so important because some of the lessons that we learned, so we had a really good attorney yep. um, and he's been our attorney for Oh my gosh. I think he's been our attorney for probably close to, I don't know, eight to 10 years. Um, so when we first um, came down, we knew that this was going to be where we would end up eventually. So we went ahead and did the things we had to do. We started our corporation. We got our bank accounts. We went through all of the holy hell of that. Um, and then, so anytime that we need something, we're always, we'll just call Rodolfo and just have a conversation with him. But um he was very honest with me. You know, sometimes you feel like when you're in a foreign country, like it's them against you. Um, if you are the expat, the uh, gringo or somebody who's not from the country, whatever. And you feel like it's them against you. Like they're probably talking to each other on the side going, how can we rip this person off? And that's because we think with our Western mentality of, of how, you know, people do stuff in our country. Um, but, um, my, our attorney, and I'm sure advocates like you, their job is just really to give you the information and make the decisions and go, look, here are all of the pitfalls that you could, that you could encounter. And there was that one point whenever he told me, he goes, Robin, you know, he, he said, Robin, you can buy this property. <laughs> you can buy this property if you want to, but I'm going to make you sign a waiver that says I advised you against it. Yep. I went to the municipality. They laughed about this property. They are, it was done with no permits. It's built on the water. It should not yes. have been. Right. 
And he just went through all of the stuff. And he was like, I'm telling you, if you buy this property and you can buy it, understand that, but you're going to sign a waiver that you do not hold me responsible because I have told you not to buy it. Yeah. I mean, look, I'm always thinking exit and I'm always talking exit just because I've exited multiple businesses and I'm always trying to figure out how I exit even before I've got in. And I do that for my clients as well. I'm like, look, you know, I was with a client the other day who had been looking at this property for a year, it was still on the market. And they hired us because they were like, look, we just couldn't get any straight answers right, right. from the realtor. The realtor couldn't give us comps. They couldn't give us really good rental information. And we have every single vacation rental in Costa Rica, uh, all of its details, as well as having a lot of hotel information. We work with a lot of property managers as well who give us the information. So and literally within two minutes, I could work out why it was not like sold and they were like well rich how did you work that out so quickly and i just went what's the ownership structure and it was six indiv individual villas on a piece of land and it was a corporation where there were six shares and each one of those shares had a villa but i said you have no separate title you own a that corporation owns all those villas and that share is just kind of designated something but there's no separate plan or like you know and you're in a corporation now it's like a it's an, it's even worse than an hoa if that makes sense like it's even more difficult than an hoa because uh, of it, its its structure. And I said, look, the resale is going to be a nightmare. So my suggestion is, if you want to do this, we will do all the due diligence. But you need to know of like, that is not going to change. And they're never changing that to a condominium. No way, just so that you're aware. Right. Uh, anyway, they ended up investing in something else, which was a much better return as well for them. Uh, and you were able to uncover something pretty well. Uh, but it's just those kind of things that you know, and they were told that it was fine. And I was like, the realtor never mentioned any of this to you. And he was like, no, they never mentioned anything. And I was like, look, if the lawyer being recommended as well, because remember, lawyers don't get paid until the transaction happens as well, just exactly. to be clear. So if the realtor is not being paid till transactions happen and the lawyer is not being paid till transaction happens, and it's a country where caveat emptor buyer beware, meaning that like people don't sue each other here because it takes for years and it'll cost yeah. you more money. Who's looking out for you? Right. You know, so that's why a lot of the stuff of what we do. And I mean, I'm a pain in the butt, Robin, and so is my team, but that's what we are. Like, like we are realtors love and hate us. And so do lawyers. They love us because we bring them highly qualified clients. They hate us because their Jedi mind tricks don't work on us. Right. Like, we know everything. Like we've built huge hotels here. We've developed lands. We've built like everything from, you know, water infrastructure to getting concessions, to drilling, to everything that's needed in building. I had a, Builder the other day told me that he could build a house in three months in front of a client. And I laughed in his face. And I said, I'm sorry, Michael, there's no way you can build a house in three months unless you're basically bringing a container that's already built and putting it there. Like, right. no way. And he was like, yes, I can. But the problem here is if you don't know better, people will come and like be like, OK, great. And it's basically the thing will take then two years. You know, you'll end up probably paying more for it. So, yeah, I mean, you know. It's, we project manage the whole thing, Robin. So I have engineers and everything in my office. We don't design. We're just owners reps throughout the whole process. And so I, this is probably a, a question that everybody will want to know. And um, there's probably not a one direct answer for it. But um, to bring on an expert like you and your team, what are they looking for investment wise to be able to go, hey, we need your help. What's this going to cost us? I mean, look, I'll be very clear. So like, for instance, a lot of the time we have a bunch of meetings before the client arrives because we really want to understand their goals. Is it lifestyle? Is it investment? Because that really determines location and also the vehicle to be investing in as well. Meaning mm -hmm. if it's a lifestyle investment, then it's all about who you are, what you like and seeing multiple areas. If it's just pure investment, then that's a different ball game. Like we've got analysts in our office that just analyze numbers and go, hey, guys, here's a list of stuff that could work you know, based on returns. But basically for that analysis, and then also we spend a day or it can be two days, is $2,000. Okay. And we also rep the client during the purchase process to make sure everything is there. If they end up buying, we give them back those $2,000. But why do we request that, Robin? Because it keeps us on their side of the transaction. The moment we are looking at commissions, we are not making the decisions in our client's best interest. And right. that's why, we do it, you know, and it's not until clients kind of go out with us that they're like, wow, like that was way more than I thought it was. Be I thought you were just going to show us properties, and we were like, well, yeah, but like I'm going to tell you the questions to ask, what to look for, what like any warning signs, and also do the analysis on it, and also show you stuff that is working in the area as well, and meet people that have kind of moved back, and or if you're looking to build a house, houses that were in the right. process or that we have built, or if you're looking to do a hotel, hotels that we've done, or you know we can open the doors to hotels and kind of show you them uh, because we've worked with a lot of them or we know their owners. So 
there's not much that we can't do. Um, and we're very honest with clients if we think that we add no value either. You know, Robin, I mean, like if, if there's certain things where we're just like, look, we don't think it's right, then we'll just say to clients, look, we're just probably not right for you or this is probably not the best way to go forward. Right. And so what if, so I, I was, while I was there, while we were there um, this past week, uh, one of the questions, cause we met, we met with the gentleman that we bought land from and, and, and he's, and he's Tico, but he would tell you, he's like, he's like, you know, he says so many people come here. He goes, I talked to them. He goes, and they like paid $200,000 for a piece of land. And then, and someone just lied to them and told them they had the title to it and they don't. And he's yeah. like, and there's nothing that they can do. They just literally cannot do anything. They can't get their money back. They didn't do anything. They bought a piece of land that doesn't belong to the person that sold it to them. And they, they did not even go through a process. And he goes, and he, and we even talked about squatters. I mean, there's a piece of property that um, a friend of his owns that these, that these people squatted on and they didn't just squat on it. They've been there so long, they built an entire business and he wants to buy the land, but he's got to buy the squatters out and the owner out. Yeah. You know, and like, those are just some real things that, you know, are something that we don't consider. Like, I don't, I would never consider that somebody would come and squat on my land and then I couldn't get them out. I mean, it's happening more and more in the U S now. It's actually happening less here, I think, and more in the U S but <laughs> Look, it sounds like, again, it comes back to good lawyer. Like, again, your your purchasing Costa Rica is only going to be as good as the team that you have on it. Right. Meaning, that, like, don't go to the seller's lawyer. Like, that guy is right. in, is aligned with the seller, not with yeah. you. So get an independent lawyer that's representing you and get him on a retainer as well. Don't just have them run around for nothing. But, like, get an agreement, get a retainer paid. And that retainer, you know, gets applied at closing anyway. But, mm -hmm. like... Selling property that's not in your name, a lawyer will pick that up in two seconds. Like right. even us asking questions, you know, we're all fluent in Spanish. You know, we've been here for years, you know, of just asking questions. You'll know in two seconds of like, hey, something's a little fishy here. But then once you start to dig a little bit further down yeah. of like going, OK, who's the property's name? in? Is it in a corporation? OK, give me the personality juridica. Who are the names on that? If that's you, I want a copy of your ID. Like it's just simple stuff that even in the offer and sales and purchase phase gets sniffed out real quick. Mm -hmm. uh, and on squatters, yeah, that does become buying an issue of land with squatters, but you just structure the deal that you don't buy land until the squatters are off. And there are legal means now and legal ways to do that because I've got clients down in Pavones dealing with that at the moment, and they've been able to remove the squatters from the property as well. Or what they've been able to do is find a way to actually work with the squatters as well, because a lot of the time when we use the word squatters, it's kind of like, oh, it's degenerates, like junkies, that kind of stuff. And that's not the case always here in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. right? Business owners that have sat on the land for 20, 30 years because nobody was ever really using right. it, you know. Um, and there there can be a, you know, whenever there's that challenge, there's always an opportunity, always in Costa Rica. Um, and again, now you've potentially got someone to take care of your land when you're there. You know, maybe you can right, right. that part of the land and sell it to them and finance it over a certain period. Maybe their business is actually something that can help whatever it is that you're going to do. Like, yeah. You know, so... But yeah, I mean, look, I think it just comes down to, Robin, of like, you know, your product project here in Costa Rica, whatever it will be, even if it's just buying a condo, it will only be as good as the team that you have on it. Right. And so then let, so how do, this is so funny because it's like, I didn't even know you existed, right? Until. Because like, we're like, I, we really don't do that much advertising. I have a podcast right. for content for that, but like, we have so much business, which is great. You know, and the team is kind of growing a little bit. I don't want it to be a huge business. I had a 150 person business. I don't want to be there where I'm sat in HR, you know, meetings constantly mm. looking at finance numbers. Like tomorrow, I'm in Uvita Dominical with a client for two days. I love being with clients. Like people sometimes are like, I can't believe you're out with us, Rich. And I'm like, Well, what were you expect? They were like, Well, we thought we'd say, get someone from your office. And I'm like, No, no, guys. Like, like this is what I love to do. So you're going to, let's just explore that a little bit. So we don't have to reveal anything about them. So you're going to Uvita Dominical tomorrow with a, with a client. Right. And, and what are you guys looking at tomorrow? Like, is it someone who's looking for their personal place? They're looking for, hey, can we invest down here? Well, look, when she first contacted me, she was like, Rich, I'm just so confused. Like, I just don't know what to do and what not to do. Like, I've been shown a bunch of stuff. I just don't have perception. And she's been coming to Costa Rica for like 10, 15 years. So she's like, look. It's probably 70% lifestyle, 30% investment. I know I want to be near Dominical because I want to grab my board. I want to be able to get on my little motorbike or my, you know, my little Suzuki mm -hmm. Jimmy. And I want to just go down to Dominical and surf. So I'm like, okay, great. Well, that makes it easier. It's Hatillo Baru Dominical, you know, Dominicalito. Like maybe as far as Playa Hermosa, but maybe not. Like she's like, I don't want to go to Evita. I'm like, that's fine. So 
you know, and then from that and then being like, who do you are? What do you like? What you don't like? You want to be in a closed community? You want to be in like a neighborhood? Like how mm -hmm. do you want to go? How North American? You know, are you open to building? Anyway, it came down to like, basically, it's kind of like a nice surf shack, she said. And shack might be probably not the right word, but like a nice surf house that you know, has a budget up to $500,000, which up in that area is, you know, you could get something nice. With Ocean View, might be a little bit more difficult. Possible, maybe, but it's going to be kind of more of a Tico style house. What you say? Uh, her, what you say her budget was? 500000 Okay. You know, um, but we're showing her stuff that's, 150 all the way up to 600 so that why because then she gets perspective but we've also like shortlisted a bunch of different properties like we work with anyone robin like you know it's not that okay we're i don't know cold war bankers so we only work with cold war bankers we're remax when we work with remax stuff like and a lot of the case all over costa rica that happens like there are these divides in it and so they don't show each other's properties i don't care like we'll show individual owners you know, where no commission is being paid. Why? Because we've already been paid and we'll do what's best for our client. So, yeah, I mean, we basically have two days looking at properties in those areas, you know, which kind of fit her lifestyle. And also from an investment point of view where she's like, I just need to cover my costs. And I'm like, look, these properties will cover your costs. Why? And these are the comps that we have in the area that are currently covering their costs so that you're aware, um, you know, and then again, we'll be out with her for two days, have fun as well. Like if we're not going to have fun, don't bother working with us because right. that's kind of the whole point. It's Costa Rica. I mean, like it shouldn't be, you know, too stressed. Right. Um, and yeah, I'd like to say we're seriously casual, Robin. We're serious about the work we do, but we're very, very casual. Like we'll have a beer at lunch with clients. Right. You know, so. I love that. Yeah. I mean, but that's, but that should be part of, this is Pura Vida. This is what you come here for anyways, is like, um, if you wanted something that was uptight and hostile, um, you could stay in the U.S. and do that all day long. Um, yeah. There was a, there is a there is a phrase that I learned while I was um, while we were doing our due diligence on that hotel, um, and I I found it to be um, so in the U.S. If you want a property and you're like I don't want to have to disclose anything, I don't want to have to tell you anything about it, you list it as is, where is. I was a realtor for a number of years. As is, where is is kind of like good luck. You know what I'm yep. saying? And so I've learned in Costa Rica that the um, the version of that in Costa Rica is, hey, it's a fire sale. <laughs> we don't want to tell you anything. It's a fire sale. Don't ask any questions. And I'm like, and I didn't get that. Like as a fire sale to me meant like she's urgent. She's motivated to sell is what it, it translated to me, but that's not what it meant. So how have you, have you, I'm sure you've encouraged, you've encountered that. And is, am, am I assuming that properly? Sometimes yes. And sometimes no. I mean, look, I, I think everything in Costa Rica from that point of view of the, the clients don't really need to divulge anything. Like it's up to you to do it's again, buyer beware. Like there is no recourse here in Costa Rica just so that everyone's aware. You know, there is recourse. It just takes 10 years mm -hmm. and a lot of money that like, you know, so it just I think as you get older, you understand if sometimes if just pay that little extra to get it done. Right, guys. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. but some people learn, some people don't. But in this circumstance, not fire sale can sometimes be majority of different stuff. But I don't think on a property that the owner is really going to divulge anything anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like a blank piece of paper and you kind of need to, you know, connect the dots. So that's why. For instance, we had a client that bought a beachfront hotel in Palo Seco. It was a fire sale. Okay. We didn't get anything. We had to bring in electrical engineers, you know, just to, to, to check all the electrics out. We knew we needed to replace all the electrics. We got their report. Um, we bought in mechanical and structural engineers as well to take a look at the property to figure out what it was. I bought in a concessions lawyer specialist to review the concession. And also then we bought in a topographer to see setbacks on the property because we found out some of the property was within the setbacks. Then also... I also bought in a hydrologist as well. Uh, why? Because the water on the property was basically from wells and it's at sea level. So we were just looking at like how salinated those wells were, how long they were going to last because there was no Asadas or AIA in the area. So it can be expensive sometimes, but like that's necessary in order to just make sure like, is it better that you spend five to $6,000 on a $1 million investment, or are you just going to jump straight in the air, like straight in the, in it, in it, and not really understand what you're getting yourself into. Cause that 1 million can turn into 1.52 very, very quickly. You know? Well, and I think another thing too, like when we were doing our due diligence, I think that uh, I felt, I don't know that I know this for sure. And there's a lot of times I just feel because I've been in the industry in the U S um, some of the 
some of the charges for some of the services that were being performed on our behalf seemed a bit exorbitant, um, like way outside the norms of well, what. Look, and like we don't make any money off that stuff, so and we don't. No, do I don't mean like I, I mean like like what these individuals like not for you. Like I'm saying, like are are you helping them find like this okay. is the best person for the job, and they're not going to rape no. you at the same time. We hold the client's hand through the process. Like if I start with you. Like, I'm going to protect you from start to finish, like, you know, on all of that stuff. Like, we already know the quotes. Like, if a, a topographer is not going to come back and be like, it's normally, I don't know, $1,200. Uh, it's, it's a gringo. Let me put it $2,000. No, 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 no. They, they're dealing with us and they do business yeah. with us so that we know those rates. And depending on the areas, we have multiple different topographers, multiple different soil studies, engineers. A lot of the time, I'll send my own engineers, Robin, um, you know, or we'll bring in, you know, a home inspector, like, from the U.S., um, who works down here as well, uh, that w has done some good work for us. Um, but yeah, I mean, we protect the client. I'm overly protective, Robin. You have to, I love I'm, that. you know, overly protective again, you know, I like to say, well, anyway, I don't know if you can do this, but like I, I'm, I'm the butthole, the human body can work without an arm and a leg and a lung, but like can't work without your butthole. And I'm right. that butthole usually in transactions. So clients get to enjoy themselves and don't need to worry right. about it. But even on that hotel, I went deep into accounting, Robin. Like I looked at the accounts of that company and I wanted to know if do they care how social security had they paid it? You know, mm -hmm. I needed to, I wanted a list of their providers and we called their providers up to make sure that, uh, that that they didn't have any debts so that when the client took it over, that they weren't taking on that liability as well. So there's a whole process from especially if you're buying an existing business, there's buying the property and then there's buying the business and there's due diligence that needs to be done on both. Um, you know, and, and that one. There was always risk here in Costa Rica. It's never not going to be risk. Like right. it's never not going to be going to be some risk. It's just, can you manage that level of risk? And right. similar to you, Robin, like your lawyer told you of like, look, it doesn't have this. It doesn't have this. If you want to buy it, that's fine. But there's going to be a waiver. And I've said that to clients as well. Look, my advice is not to buy this because of X, Y, and Z. It is mm -hmm. up to you. And so let's think about that for just a second too, because I love everything you're saying because the fact that, um, there are so many unknowns that you've already worked through what it looks like. So let's talk about buying an existing business because there's a lot about that. That is a whole other layer of crap that you don't anticipate, right? Like, right. because we're used to doing business in the U S or in the UK or in Canada. And we're like, not we in Costa Rica, when you buy a business, are you also getting the staff and are you obligated to keep them? Okay. So what we always do is make sure that staff are, Fired and rehired uh, under a new contract. New contract. Why? Because then I'm not taking on all those, um, you know, social security liabilities of um, sesentia, aguinaldos, and also like when I let go of someone, I need to pay them a certain amount of time. Mm -hmm. um, basically, like um, I can't remember what you guys call it. You know, we call it. Um, you know, like when you fire someone, you have to give them money. Severance um, is what we call it. And it can be up to eight years here in Costa Rica. There's a limit wow. of up to eight years. But you need to understand here if like. The government is on the side of the employee, not on your side. So you need to protect yourself. So we basically, when like in a business, you fire the staff, the old owner then pays off those, those people, everything necessary. So we need to see that, pays off security, and then they're rehired. Sometimes that could be rehired in the same company or can be rehired in a brand new company that's completely clean, Robin, as well. Because if it's an older company, you need to check their taxes, you need to make sure they're paying their sales tax, you know, right. that they've done you know, their, their declaration of who the owners of it are and et cetera, et cetera. So, um, yeah, on, on that front, you've got that. And then you just need to make sure of like, usually when we do business, we usually do a hold back uh, of a certain percent. So say you're buying a business for, I don't know, I'm just going to say $100,000. We're like, look, we're going to have a five grand hold back here for like 60 days, just in case anything comes up as well. Um, you know, and that usually escrow, not dealing with stuff with checks across the table. Like that's a nightmare right. because of foreigners. I mean, I buy stuff with checks across the table, Robin. Um, but like, that's me personally buying stuff. You know, I bought one the other day in Manuel Antonio, more land where I gave the check to the lawyer uh, where I went and got the check, but we, we were under contract. So, and the seller was a friend of mine, so it wasn't too bad, but buying a business can be very complicated, you know, and depending on what type of business is, does it have its business licenses? Does it has it been paying its taxes, both at a municipal and government level? Um, it's a it's as I like to call a chainsaw juggling act, where like it's not for yeah the the, the you know the lighthearted. Right. 
And that was part of one of the reasons why, I mean, there was like about 17, but that was one of the 17 reasons why we didn't move forward with buying that hotel also um, was because of the fact that um, their current business license, well, it wasn't current, their business license had expired. So they had no license to even operate as a hotel, restaurant, bar, any of that. And um, not my attorney, the uh, the realtor that was representing this property was like, that's not a big deal. You're just going to go down there and they're going to reinstate it. Uh, there's no guarantees of that. Like, I mean. Well, and this is why I say is who is on your side of the track? Right, exactly. Yeah. And, exactly. and I'm going to tell you, we did. Um, even though we didn't close on that property, like we paid our attorney. We're like, yeah. you know, give it, send us a bill for what all that you did. Because I know, like, I don't want him to be like, oh, they just keep putting properties under contract, whatever. They're never going to close. Um I'm like, no, send, send us the bill for whatever, all that work that you did, because he is in San Isidro and he literally had to come down to Golfito, you know, to meet with the municipality, to walk the property, to do all of that stuff. He had expenses. We had a, we did have a building inspection done, a yep. structural engineer come in um, and he's from the U.S. too. So maybe the same guy um, did a good job letting us know what was going on structurally with the property. And we had, we had a bunch of inspections. We we're like, look, I know that you had to arrange all of that. We want to pay you for your time. I want to pay you for the services that you did, because I didn't even know that that was a thing that they didn't generally get paid unless they closed on the transaction, the attorney. Yeah. Because, because yeah. that's not how it is in my world. Yeah. They, they typically don't, they don't get paid. I mean, usually I make my clients pay a retainer. Why? Because then the then it kind of engages the the lawyer rather than the lawyer having to wait. You know, again, you know, it's the carrot. You know, the horse before the carrot. Well, the uh, carrot. You know, in front of the horse, etc. So, a, a little bit of that like they don't get paid until the transaction happens. But it's always nice to have kind of expenses covered, kind of within your pocket rather than coming. For out sure. Of for sure. So, for sure. I just believe that's a smarter way to do business. I think so too. And so then your advice. Um, for anybody who's either coming in to buy property, they've never bought property in Costa Rica before, um, or coming in to buy investments, or coming in to purchase a business or start a business, they should start with you. Well, they don't always need to start with us. Like, I would love to say, yes, Robin, everyone start with us. You know, for some people, it feels right. Some people just, you know, they don't want to pay for it. They're like, no, 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 I don't want to pay for it. I'm like, I would never do that. Like, you know, you've been in business enough where you're just like, look, again, your project or your investment is only as good as your team on it. Like if you were going to make an investment in the stock market, you're just going to just throw it out there, you know, or you're going to speak to an like an actual investment advisor, you know, um, because, again, there's just so many ways it could go wrong. It could go wrong if you're aware of it. I mean, I would love to say, yeah, feel free to have a call with us, guys. Like, um, you know, there's I mean, we do a 15 or 30 minute free consultation where we can kind of chat with you uh, and just point you in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Right. We'll give you all of our contacts and our Rolodex. Um, I, I think the other thing to mention, Robin, is we also build for clients as well. Like we project manage the whole build from start to finish. So we've got about 30 builds on in Costa Rica at the moment. Um, I think our, we do some commercial stuff as well. We're doing the Pequeño Mundo in El Adora. We just finished the Pequeño Mundo in Perezelon as well that you've got up there. Um, so we do that from a commercial, but just administrating that project. That's kind of the bigger stuff. But we do small homes. Um, you know, we've done a, remodels for our clients as well. Why? Because I kind of don't want to send them off, you know, to get, confused out there whereas i'm like look guys i have project managers in my in my business who have years of experience building here in costa rica and you know we're building in everywhere from tres rios de osa down there you know south of ojachau all the way to one of the to Aranel here in the city playa hermosa mount antonio Aranel, nosada like all over the country but we just project manage so we just sit on it make sure that the architect who never designs to budget never designs to budget <laughs> Yeah, we'll always go 40% over. So what we do is throughout that whole process is constantly updating the budget. We're in the meetings with the architects. Even before you've started, we'll give you a list of architects based on the design that you want. And you can work with whoever. I mean, we work with whoever. But we're optimizing that design to also your budget because the architect doesn't care. And you won't find that until you go back to bidding, you know, for your project. And we go back to bid for five companies. The architect probably won't, you know, and the engineers. We bid with five companies, bring it back, analyze it all, value engineer it. You know, we had, we're about to start a building on a chow for a client at the moment where the budget was 550. The design came out at 750, which we knew it would do. And then we basically value engineered it out to 550 for them. How, you know, windows, doors, flooring, um, some of the outside areas, reducing spaces a little bit, you know, and we're able to do that really quick, you know, but 
Usually that doesn't happen because we're through the design process. We're constantly updating the budget so the client can see it. So there are no surprises. Right. You know, um, that's so ins- that's so important. I mean, I think about that. I think about the overwhelmingness of it. And I, and if any of you guys are watching and you feel like you're just sitting in with like a free consultation I'm having with Richard about what I'm doing. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one of the things is like, so this property that we've purchased down in Golfito, and I know you didn't mention that you said down Tres Rios, like, it's not that much further. Uh, it's about two hours. Um, <laughs> it's a flight. You fly everywhere, Robin. I mean, oh, we... cool. well, then they've got a nice airport. You're good to exactly. go. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and so we're looking at like, we literally just, we came down, it was a short trip. We were only down for five days. And it was really just to walk the property again and get a feel for like where the valleys are, and where the flat spots were, because our ideal goal is on that. It's like right at 12 acres um, is to um, put casitas I want to put like probably 15 casitas on there. And then I want to build like two, uh, three bedroom, three bath family homes on there also. Um, and then our residents will be there also. So it will be lifestyle and investment for us um, because we, we love where it's at and we, we want to run that, run that portion of that business ourselves too. And um, my business partner, um, Beverly, like we are, we always say that together we're one whole person because I'm, I'm always the visionary and she's the integrator and she's, so she'll stay up at night because now there's way too many options and I don't know what to think about. What do I think about first, blah, 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 blah. And me, and I'm like, I just want, all I need to know is what's the first step, right? That's all I ever need to know is what's the first step. And then yeah. when I'm in the middle of that one right now, then I'll be going, what's the next step? And I don't need to know 15 steps down for me, for her. She needs to know everything like right off the bat at the beginning, like, well, like how, how will this all look? Well, it's, she gets so overwhelmed by all the details of it. Um, and so um, we know that before we make that, because we've done zero yet, other than just come down now, we staked out some stuff according to the survey and the topography that we had um, that, you know, we'll be like, okay, I mean, you'll probably be our next step anyways, because we, we don't know, we cannot wrap our brain around what the next step is. I have so many questions already, Robin, like, does it have a public road, which determines its zoning? If it, okay, so that's it. You've got good zoning there. Like, you know, so that you could go ahead and subdivide this. What does your exit look like from this project, you know, down the line? So the reason that I ask that is because I'd like to work back from it, meaning that like, mm-hmm. is it one owner that comes in and buys everything? Or are you going, no, like we want to sell off these certain lots potentially at some point, which means like, okay, you need to subdivide that land. You could subdivide it into 5,000 square meter agricultural lots, or you can go down the road of like a condominium development. And I say not developing a condominium, but through the subdivision of land. So- <laughs> You know, you know, what's the water? What's the water source? Where is that coming from? You know, if it's coming from Aya, the Asada, like then speaking with those guys. And uh, so, we, so we have a creek on the property. With a concession? Active concession? Yes. Okay. Like what's the flow rate of that creek? Because that's going to determine how much you can build. Like, right. you need to, like So, you know, I'm already way down the rabbit hole here, mm-hmm. Rob. No, but it's- so, so we've been down the rabbit hole too. So uh, at, even at first, like we, I, I literally I climbed down into the creek this past weekend. Like I literally went down there because that's my concern too. Is like, first of all, is this even drinkable water? Is there enough water down there? Because we're in the dry season right now, right? Yeah. And it had rained the night before. So there was some down there, but the flow for me, like was not good enough to support even one house, yeah. right? Like, so it doesn't matter like that there is water down there. I've got to be able to I mean, getting the water up and that's not, that's not a problem. Those are all just me- mechanical issues, but like, I didn't see enough there. So then now am I going to have to look at a well and he owns the property next to it. So he's willing to grant gravity for right now. But if he sells that property, then I'm in a mess as well. Right. So I've got to have my own source. Yeah. yeah I mean, look, your water source is everything when it comes to, you know, your, your project here. See um, that for me, I already knew that that was step one. I knew what step one was. I've yeah. I, water. You know, but then you have to go deeper in that water and take a look at flow rates in the driest part of the year, because that's going to determine really how much you build with regards to permitting, because your concession is going to tell you flow rate liters per second. That liters per second, based on what your building calculation, then will help determine what you can build on that property, you know. Um, So, yeah, I mean, and then from there, it's like, okay, dig a well, but it can't be an artisanal well, because an artisanal well can only do one home. So, like, how are you going to do that? Maybe it might be a perforated well, Robin, and there's a lot of interesting stuff happening with perforated wells at the moment of like they're using, you know, these Starlink uh, uh, satellites at the moment to get an idea of where the veins are running. And then also they can go a little bit deeper. You pay a little bit more money and get an idea of flow liters per second, 
we're on a project with an Asada up in Guanacaste at the moment working on that one. Um, you know, we're in a multiple different things, but why? Because it all comes together. Like right. I have an engineer from AIA on my team, you know, um, from Aguas y Apuductos, which is basically the government organization right. that runs water here, uh, civil engineers, you know, uh, structural engineers. Why? Because all the team needs to come together whenever we look at a project, because really quick, we can tell you what you can't and, and, and can't, you can and can't do. And also your options of how to go about it and also a rough estimation of costs, like, but a real cost, not like, hey, I can get that house built in three months for a hundred thousand dollars, where you're like, no, dude, it's a 10 month build and it's six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. You know, someone will always do it cheaper in Costa Rica. Understand that, guys. Always. But you and people are nice here. The problem here is they won't bring you bad news because they don't like the confrontation. Oh, that's that's 100 percent accurate. I mean, that's probably the best summary of that I've ever heard. I've, I mean, even with my attorney, when it was those times, he was just like, I'm, I'm going to I'm just going to tell you, you can do what you want to. You're more than welcome to do whatever. And I'm like, so would you buy it? And he's like, no, I wouldn't buy it. Yeah. I'm like, well, why would I buy something you wouldn't buy then? Yeah. And uh, what well, people do. but uh, anyway. I, And I understand. I'm, I'm just not one of those people. And I'm not risk averse. Beverly's risk averse. I'm not risk averse. I'm yeah. I, I I'm I'm okay with a good risk, but like especially whenever you look at a place that um well, I'm gonna go back to the stupid hotel that first of all was built over the water with no permits. That's a nightmare. It, I can already yeah, tell you. It's a concession it, nightmare. In in a town where um where the Marriott is getting ready to come in, right? So Marriott, if Marriott's coming in, they're coming in, starting to build and the property value is going to start increasing. The first thing that's going to happen is I'm going to have to knock off half of my hotel eminent domain or however they call it in Costa Rica, because this wasn't, show me the permits, how this was built. Like this is illegal. Get this off here. I, I would say this, Robin, a lot of the time that probably won't happen. No one's going to come along and say, knock this down, et cetera. But what's going to happen is when you go to resell that property, the next buyer is going to have all those questions and it's going to make it even more difficult. Mm -hmm. So that's well, the that, really the way to look at it. And if we were going to buy it and hold it forever, we were like, okay, fine. I think we'd be okay. But we didn't ever plan on buying and that and holding it forever. But Costa Rica isn't for everyone. And there'll come times where this country will like drag on you as well. Just like getting stuff done here just takes a lot longer unfortunately there are some things that are a lot quicker like building is a lot quicker here people in the us are like wow i can't believe that you can build that quickly like they're blown away by that and i'm like yeah if you get it right it can be done very quickly mm -hmm. but there are stuff like permitting and government institutions here that if you don't know what you're doing um yeah then it just takes a very long time this is a country of network like that process means nothing, guys. It's a country of your network, both politically at a municipal level and also a government level and also who knows who and also is how you're seen by those people. Because you have to remember, Costa Rica is 80% relationships, 20% business. Meaning if you don't have that 80% relationship with people, good luck. I like agree. you just name it a piece of paper and you'll just keep going to the bottom line because buddy that he knows is going to jump to the top of the line. It's how it works. I'm sure it's the same in the rest of the world, but it really applies here in Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. And that's the thing is that you feel, um, you feel isolated is probably the wrong word, but you feel out of the loop, right? Like there's a loop somewhere, you know, it exists, but you're not part of it. And so yeah. until you become part of that, then you're just literally at the grace of whoever is going to show you kindness and help you with something. But so let's talk about one more thing. Let's go back and go your ideal, your ideal client. Like I know you go all the way from we're, we're going to build a, a residential home to somebody to we build hotels and help with investment properties. But like there's got to be like the majority of your business falls into, into a pocket. Who are they? I mean, individuals. I don't like to work with big financial institutions. Like when it gets corporate, Robin, I'm out. Like yeah. I'm like, guys, it's not fun. Like if it's not fun and there's no relationship, like again, it's 80% business, 20%, no, 80% relationships, 20% business. And I even say that it's probably 50-50 in our business. But like, you know, our ideal client is like someone that's looking to make some form of an emotional investment in Costa Rica. Like there is an emotion involved. If it's a 100% investment, yeah, we're happy to do that. But like there needs to be some fun had on this as well. Um, because also we kind of pull back the curtains of tourism in like of Costa Rica and kind of show them where the locals hang out and like mm -hmm. um, being in the area, you know, from a, even infrastructure point of view or buildings that are happening and what's happening. But I think um, that, yeah, sorry. I think my did he, did he need you? No, uh, I've got a, I could, that's one of my guys, Pablo here basically is doing something in my garden here and I think he needs me for something. But anyway, don't worry, he can wait. That's all good. Uh, <laughs> 
I mean, our ideal client are people basically, I would say, foreigners looking to smartly invest here in Costa Rica. And that can even just be a lifestyle investment, meaning that looking to perhaps look for a certain type of life that maybe they don't have. And they're just not too sure where to, where to get that. I mean, someone that's been here for years, you know, and kind of really knows how things work, like we might not be that much help unless you're going to start to do something on a, like it turns into a business, like it becomes more of an investment there. And we help a lot of people here in Costa Rica, uh, even all the, you know, are some of the wealthiest in this country, you know, on the right thing to do here. We had one at the moment who's like, hey, Rich, build me eight homes in Costa Rica, go. Like, and that's my direction. So we did the whole analysis, said this were the eight locations, uh, and we're about to start construction on one. You know, we've closed on land on the other two. We're in design phase. But ideal client, I, I wouldn't, what I, I would say, what we don't want is kind of like investment portfolio managers, that kind of stuff. From the, Just looking at this from a ones and zeros. We don't mind working with them, but it's not as fun as like, you know, I mean, people like yourself and Beverly that were like, hey, you know, we've got a project we want to do in Costa Rica where we can, even before we start, do the numbers for you and go, this is what it's going to kind of look like, you know, um, or maybe that's not the right area because of X, Y, and Z, you know, or like here are hotels in that area, you know, that are doing pretty well. And this is why they do well, um, you know, and you can chat with their managers. We know their managers. You can chat with them and get an idea. So I, I think it's, you know, I mean, we can do it. Every, sometimes we do tours in Spanish. We all speak fluent Spanish. So, but like, it's just people looking to make some form of an emo emotional investment in Costa Rica. And that can be for their lifestyle. It can be for their pocketbook. Um, and yeah, and th they just want someone's like, help to guide them kind of through the right. craziness here. So what's uh, step one for them then? So step one, I know I need help. I know I want to do this. I know I'm committed to this. What's step one? Well, I mean, look, they can go to our website, investingcostarica.com. Um, we also have a podcast as well with nearly 200 episodes on it. Um, you know, from everything from politicians to architects to realtors, everyone on it, you can mm -hmm. listen to that. Um, but I think just reach out to us. You know, you can email us info at investing at Costa Rica dot com. Um, you can just type in my name, Richard Bexon. I'm sure some stuff will come up and just contact us and have a free consultation and let us chat with you. And like, even if you don't end up using us, don't worry, like just like use the information that we we, we gave you in that 15 to 30 minutes and and, and, and do what you will with it. Um, but yeah, that's probably the easiest way. I mean, and, I think and we'll, we'll drop all of the links to uh, connect with Richard in the show notes. So just scroll down and you'll find all of that um, so that you you don't have to go and hunt him. I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys everything that I have. Cool. Well, I think it's, look, my biggest strength is I love to help people. My biggest weakness is I love to help people. <laughs> so, like I'm a sucker for saying no to people just because I've been in that. And there's nothing worse than like, if I have the information, let me try and give it to you. If I can help you, let me try and help you. You know, I mean, everyone's trying to make a living. The majority of my income, Robin, comes from making investments in Costa Rica and developing stuff, not helping clients. But why do we like to do it? Because there's a need for it. I like to do it. Uh, it gives jobs to Costa Ricans as well who are very smart. The moment that you meet with some of our team, you're like, oh, my God, these are like professionals that are really smart. Like, Love yes, it. this country is full of really smart people. Right. You know, there's a, there's a reason that all these tech and biotech companies are moving to Costa Rica. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'll tell you, it's funny that you say that because I, I always say, because in the U S um, we serve, we serve the automotive industry in the U S I have a marketing firm uh, that, that is our niche is, is um, auto car dealerships. Um, but then we also, um, if you go to a dealership's website, and you're looking at a Toyota Tacoma uh, and you go, I want more information on this vehicle. And you put your information in that lead comes in and I have a, um, I have 170 seat, what they call BDC, which is business development center. That's what it's called in the automotive space and other parts of the country, they would call it, you know, a call center, BPO, whatever. Um, so we have 170 seat BDC here. And, um, and we, and we started out like knowing nothing about this. It was just a need in the market um, for this to happen, um, during COVID, like, um, all of those people who worked in the BDC and dealerships, um, the majority of them are women had to go home and homeschool, or that's the first department that the dealership cut whenever all of those restrictions came upon the dealerships, whether they, in some States they were, the sales portion was deemed essential and some, uh, States it wasn't. So, and we cover coast to coast. So we like just grew and grew and grew and grew. But I tell people all the time that if somebody bought the 11 acres next door to me 
and decided to put a BDC, a automotive um, call center in over there, I would literally walk over, say hello and go, look, here's all the mistakes I've made. Here's all the things that nobody would tell me that I had to learn the hard way. Here's all the ways I lost money in the first five years. Here's, here's the only place that it, there's a good margin. I would literally tell them that because like, I just want, every, there's besides the fact that I don't believe in competition, I just believe that there's, there really is enough out there of people are doing a good job. There's enough work out there for people who are doing a good job at what they do. And, yeah. um, and I love what I do. And so I believe in what we do. So I, have that same uh, mentality that you do. Like uh, there are other parts of my business that make a lot more money than this, than this piece of it. But this is the piece that the dealership needs. Um, people think of a dealership as a city, right? There's service department, parts department. There's the, the new cars, used cars. There's the title department. There's the title clerks. There's all of this stuff in there. And that's a whole city of people. There's a the detail department, the recon. Um, there's a whole city of people. And it's our job to um, make sure that that city has work. And that all starts with that first thing. So as long as we think about that, that we're taking care of every employee there by what we do here, then, then we keep ourselves, we keep ourselves in business. We want to do that. Um, we have a real struggle, um, with bilingual, um, agents in, in where I'm at right now. We're in, I'm in middle America and we're, it's pretty homogenous here. It's, it's not very diverse at all. And so I know that, um, I, I would love, I'm all about stimulating an economy just like you are, right? I'm all about creating jobs. I never, ever set out to be a millionaire. I set out to create a hundred jobs. That was my goal all the time. How can I create a hundred jobs of people that sit in my community that go play little league, that go to church, that go do the things and I can help them pay their rent or pay their mortgage or pay their car payment or do that thing because because they came and worked for me and I can help do that. And so I would love to do that in Costa Rica as well and go, how can I stimulate an economy in an area that is a little suppressed right now? It's not, it's not the place yet, right? How can I do that? And so yeah. that's one, that's one of our passions for why, why we want to be where we want to be. I think the saying when the tide rises, all boats rise applies, you know, to that. And I think it does in everything of just like, look, just help people out. The tide will rise and everyone will do well. Like there's no point in fighting. It does nothing for anyone. Mm -mm. So. Richard, it has been an honor and a joy. And mm -hmm. I can't wait to actually um, uh, engage you and your company to help us on our adventure. Because I didn't, even though we spoke about this when we did our pre-interview, I don't know that I understood the full um, impact of, of what you do and how you do it. And so I'm excited that... Um, we will pick you up and have that have that liaison and that those extra set of eyes and ears to help us walk through this process of the adventure in Costa Rica. No, I'm, I look, and I think that's it. Of like, look, we're in many facets of business and different areas, but why? Because then we can, you know, we can manage that whole project from start to finish, so that people don't get lost, and we can just oversee it and make sure it's done. We're, we're project managers. That's it. Owners, reps, and project managers from start to finish. We don't just find it, you know, all the way through. So, so yeah. I love that. I love that. Well, if, like I said, anybody's looking um, to find Richard, all the links are going to be down below. Or like you said, you probably just Google him. You're going to find a ton of information out there. Um, and I think that if you're considering becoming an expat in Costa Rica or you already are one and you just are renting and you haven't purchased anything and you haven't made that next step, just reach out, get a consultation with his team and uh, let's see where it goes. I mean, Pura Vida, we're all looking for it. And how, how do we do it and not not be bitter at the end of the day, not be mad because we didn't do it right. And usually that's just a really trusted advisor that will help you get um, on the other side of that and, and have you more pura vida and less ang anxiety probably. Yeah. Um, so thank you, Richard. I know you have a million things to do and I don't want to interrupt you any further. And I just want to say thank you to everybody. Remember to subscribe share this podcast with anybody else who is looking to come down here because this is good, valuable information that they would love to have. Everybody have a great day. Richard, thank you. Thank you.